Okay, let's talk a little bit about chapter 9 and these late deterministic and stochastic radiation effects. Okay? So here's my objectives. It's pretty short. I've got 29 slides for you. Less than that, actually. We're going to compare the risk models for various radiation exposures. This is not a lecture to fall asleep in. This is why I'm keeping it so short and sweet, is I want to make sure that this risk model thing stays with all of us because it is, it is very important, and it's going to guide our understanding going forward. It's probably the major thing that I could see changing in the course of your lifetime is we might reevaluate these risk models at some point, and that would be like a, a global and international decision. Um, we're going to compare early and late effects of radiation exposure. I want to make sure that we're crystal clear on the difference between what is an early effect and what is a late effect, and how we break the late effects into two different categories, and then we'll talk about epidemiology of these radiation-induced cancers. Because that, for us, in all honesty, um, if you come away from this course understanding that the primary concern that we should have as people occupationally exposed to radiation is related to cancer, and this is what the science is telling us right now. So let's look at early effects versus late effects. Um, Early effects are those biologic effects that occur relatively soon, and they're typically related to a very high dose of radiation, right? So like two gray or more whole body. Now, in radiation therapy, we give two gray to like a targeted area, and we might see some of these early effects in that targeted area. But a lot of times when we're talking about early effects, we're talking about whole body doses of two gray or more. Um, a lot of the evidence comes from... Uh, Animal studies, so studies on mice that's been extra extrapolated into human populations, um, as well as some human irradiated populations like the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors, as well as Chernobyl survivors. Um, they are not common in diagnostic imaging. We've talked about how the two early effects that we might see um, potentially in any diagnostic imaging, so whether it's nuke med, x ray, etc., CT. The two ones that we're talking about are skin burns, and those would be related to fluoro, particularly like cardiac cath, and possibly certain kind of renal studies could potentially cause skin burns, and then uh, epilation, right? So erythema, epilation are the ones that we could potentially see in diagnostic imaging. Um, there is one, and those are all, I want to make this point right now. The early effects that we're talking about are all deterministic. Every single early effect that we talk about in this class is a deterministic effect. So that means that it is a um, threshold, nonlinear model that we use to talk about that. And the, uh, the amount of response is determined by the amount of the dose. So the amount of skin reddening is in part determined by the amount of radiation that a person received. The late effects, we can have two categories of late effects. We can have the late deterministic somatic effects, and then we can have late stochastic. They used to be called probabilistic effects. They could also be called or thought of as, as random effects. Um, so one way to imagine it is you're sitting in this class now, and you've had to put up with three semesters of Benny Roberts teaching you, and so I'm going to give you all a quarter. The fact that you've survived this dosage of Benny Roberts is, gives you a quarter, right? Your exposure has given you a quarter. Now, if I were to say all of y'all flip a quarter, and whoever gets ahead, sit down, right? And we flip the quarter until there's only one person standing, that would be completely random. Because in theory, we could all flip the quarter 500 times and remain standing, in theory. It's completely a random process. It doesn't matter what I flipped the quarter what, and it was heads last time. It is still a 50% 50 50 chance that it could be heads the next time, right? The belief that it could be anything other than heads, no matter how many times I flipped it, is what they call the gambler's fallacy, Right? That like, oh, it's hit red so many times um, that now it has to hit black. No, it doesn't. It could hit red the next 500 million times and then finally hit black, right? So it is a completely random process dictated by a 50-50% rule. The same is kind of true with these stochastic effects. 
and those are things like cancer um, and any kind of hereditary effects. These late effects, uh, by definition, are radiations that are delivered over a long interval of time. So again, just to review, these early deterministic effects used to be called non-stochastic, but now we just call them deterministic. As the radiation dose increases, the severity will also increase. And these results have a threshold, right, beyond which, uh, before the threshold, they will not be apparent, after which they're present. So here's what that model looks like for early deterministic radiation effects. This model is the one that we look to. And so we've indicated that there's a threshold here, and the, the, we only start to see the effect after we go past that threshold with our radiation dose. And these are typically acute doses, but there's one exception to that, and it is cataracts, right? So we'll talk more about cataracts in just a moment. So, again, just to recap, these are going to be things that happen within hours, minutes, days, weeks, sometimes, of the exposure. They require a substantial amount of radiation, and the only ones that are identified as potentially causing this are radiation therapy and interventional radiography. We should not even see these in nuclear medicine. Again, they are things like the skin effects. So here is documentation from uh, Hiroshima of uh, moist disquamination, burns, uh, damage, permanent hair loss, and the hematologic effects would be another early effect that we could potentially see in diagnostic imaging or in radiation therapy. We're constantly getting people's white blood cell counts to see can they continue treatment because what we found is whole body irradiation doses as low as 0.25 gray in tissue could produce hematologic depression, particularly of uh, leukocytes and some uh, erythrocytes. Another kind of early effect, again, is the acute radiation syndrome, which I think, I think we've got a pretty good handle on by now. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this term epidemiology. Um, this is going to be a science that deals with the incidence or distribution as well as the control of disease in a population. Well, what's the disease here? It is a, what we would call etiologic, um, etiologic or disease-causing process. And that disease-causing process is radiation. We're going to treat radiation as though, not necessarily that it was a disease, but a disease-causing process, and then we'll study that epidemiologically. So these studies consist of observations over a long period of time with huge populations, and we look at incidence rates within these large populations. So I mentioned in the past that we have had an occupational exposure study that's been going on since 1980s that's looked at over 100,000 x-ray techs who are occupationally exposed to radiation for at least two years, most of them longer. And then we also have huge populations people's more than 200,000 people as well as their offspring that we've been uh, continuing to research after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's what these large data sets are, right? Chernobyl has been a much more difficult large data set to manage, which is why we've got two separate scientific groups looking at it, because it has global ramifications. There was a lot of people who actually moved into the Chernobyl area after the power plant failure, knowing that it was contaminated because they were refugees from like Tajikistan or different um, Soviet bloc nations who had witnessed tremendous amounts of persecution, moved to Chernobyl knowing that it was contaminated because they just didn't want anyone to mess with them ever again. Right? There were also people who were there at Chernobyl who were exposed to radiation and then evacuated. So we have people coming in, huge people groups coming into the area, as well as huge people groups leaving the area, and it's been very difficult data to track. Um, but what the researchers do is they compare the incidence that cancer naturally occurs, like for example cancer, with the incidence in that irradiated population, and they ask, are the risk factors great enough? Does it look like we're seeing an increase of cancer after this radiation exposure? 
So, with that in mind, let's talk about these late types of radiation effects. I've mentioned that they're the big one, the number one thing that we're concerned with is carcinogenesis or the ability of radiation to cause cancer. Well, this is a lot of, this is one of those moments when a lot of our patients ask, why the heck are we treating, I have breast cancer, right? Why are you treating my breast cancer with radiation? Doesn't radiation cause cancer? Yes, radiation has been shown to cause like leukemia and certain other solid tumors. But the chances that it would cause that cancer um, are long-term effects, right? So what we've done is we've looked at a population of breast cancer. We've said the average age of incidence is somewhere in, in the person's 50s. And so the average time that it takes to initiate tumor development after radiation exposure is like 50 years. So this person would be 100 years old before they would see a cancer that comes from a radiation exposure to their breast for breast cancer, right? So we are not concerned in the, cancer, in the chances of a, of a person who has breast cancer, they're 50 or 60 years old, we're not as concerned with the radiation potentially causing cancer because the person already has cancer and it would take 50 years to potentially develop cancer. Um, but with a child, we are concerned. That is a legitimate concern. And so St. Jude and other hospitals do long-term uh, post-treatment studies to see what have been the long-term effects of chemo and radiation therapy on this uh, pediatric population. Cataractogenesis. This is another occupational hazard of working around radiation, particularly for people who work in the fluoro suite, right? Y'all all, if you're working in a fluoro suite, you should go ahead and grab yourself some lead impregnated glasses or goggles because radiation that you receive on a day-in, day-out basis in the fluoro suite, once it reaches too gray of repeated exposures, you are going to see an increased incidence of cataracts among those fluoro operators, right? Again, it's not guaranteed that you will see cataracts, but it is the likelihood, the risk will increase. And then there's embryo embryologic effects that can happen as late effects of radiation exposure. These are birth defects, and we've already mentioned that they are largely linked to things like mental retardation would be the number one um, stochastic effect. So we will call this a late effect. It is probably more related to an acute exposure. All of these late effects of radiation exposure have this model. They are considered linear, non-threshold responses by all the scientific bodies that exist. Every single scientific body uses this model to evaluate risks, late re risks of radiation exposure. Why do they use this threshold model or non-threshold model? It, this assumes that there is no safe radiation dose. There's no safe radiation dose. The, even the smallest exposure to patient scatter could potentially lead to problems. The reason for that way of thinking is this forces us to have regulations and monitoring and rules in place to prevent people's radiation exposure. In fact, medicine is the only, the only um, industry worldwide that is allowed to intentionally expose people to radiation. If you think about it, like nuclear power plants, they cannot intentionally expose people to radiation, right? Um, the, the food companies and the magazine companies that use radiation to monitor things cannot intentionally expose the general public to radiation. Only we have been given the autonomy to intentionally expose the general public to radiation, and so we're going to follow this, these guidelines. So this is the way that we think about carcinogenesis from that model. This is the most important late stochastic effect of any radiation exposure, and it's completely random, right? It does not have a threshold that we've detected yet. 
Um, and the severity of the disease is not dose related. Like if you've got cancer, you've got cancer. That's pretty much as bad as it gets, right? Um, and what we know about cancers is that even though there are different kinds of cancers and different kinds of tissue that can become cancerous, and that does determine the severity or how well it will respond to, to treatment, mut a mutated cell that's reproducing itself is bad, period, in this, in this model of thinking. So here are some historical evidences of this ability of radiation exposures to cause cancer, which our textbook goes into. One of them is the radium watch style painters, like prior to around the time of World War I. Uranium miners, who are largely Navajo Indians, so they produced a large population base that was exposed to uranium and inhaled uranium dust into their lungs, had an increased incidence of lung cancer. Um, Early medical radiation workers, so dentists and x-ray techs and radiologists who were exposed to unshielded radiation from like Crookes tube sources and things like that, patients who were injected with thoratrast, which was an actually radioactive iodine, uh, radio, uh, contrast agent, infants who were treated with radiation x-rays to their thymus gland, um, children of the Marshall Islanders who were exposed to radiation during atomic bombs testings, Again, I mentioned nuclear, the nuclear bomb survivors, um, patients who were given uh, postpartum radiation treatments to their breasts to reduce mastitis and infection of the breast. They were given radiation, uh, and, and we saw an increase of breast cancer incidence among that population. And then I mentioned the evacuees of Chernobyl, as well as the refugees who, who moved, intentionally moved to Chernobyl, um, have all experienced um, Increase in solid tumors, uh, leukemia, and thyroid cancer. One thing to point out is even though this carcinoma of the arm is a fairly rare tumor, right, it is not different from any other kind of carcinoma. It is still just a carcinoma of the arm. It's not as though this carcinoma is going to start growing arms and legs and become some kind of super carcinoma. It is carcinoma, period, and it was caused by radiation burns. So I've mentioned that there are these different dose response curves, and we've talked about how, signif how significant they are, right? Let me zoom in just a little bit here. So I've said that this straight line curve, number one, what do we call this kind of curve? Good. Non-threshold linear, right? There's another way that we could potentially think about this, because I mentioned that, for example, roughly 6% of the population is born with some form of mental handicap, right? So we already have a baseline amount of the population that is born with mental handicaps, right? This is one of those terrifying things as a parent. So we could potentially also draw this model like this, where we say there's a baseline amount of the population that already receives some kind, they already are struggling with some kind of birth defect, right? Radiation would increase that, right? So this is another way of drawing that linear, non-threshold dose response, okay? It's the exact same curve, it's just taking into account natural incidence, okay? This one right here, what will we call curve number two? Linear threshold, good. Because we have a threshold of radiation dose at which the response begins, but it begins in a linear manner. And then this one we will call threshold or threshold nonlinear. Linear non-threshold. Sometimes it's abbreviated L. Uh, I'm sorry, NLT, nonlinear threshold. And this sometimes is abbreviated LNT, linear non threshold. So, thresholds occur at a point in which a response or reaction to that increasing stimulus, we first measure it, right? Um, the threshold means that below a certain radiation dose, we would not expect to see that biological response, 
Um, and we only would see that response after that threshold is crossed. Non-threshold means that any radiation dose has the capability of producing some biologic effect. And these are typically related to late radiation effects. Um, and the assumption here is that no radiation amount can be assumed to be safe. Here again is that curve. But is that really accurate? Right? That, that's the question that scientists are asking now, and it's one of the reasons why I'm stressing the distinction between these two models, and I'm saying that this could change, potentially change, in the course of your lifetime. And that would have ramifications in policy and the way that we handle this stuff in the workplace. Um, the Committee on Biologic Effects and Ionizing Radiation in 1980 first suggested that this could be a linear quadratic equation that best expresses the data. Why are they saying that? Well, if you look at the actual data sets that they're getting, they aren't these nice, neat things that we're seeing right now. They've got these scattershot points all over the place, right? And they have a certain kind of trend to them, but it's difficult to say within these scattershot points whether this is really a straight line or whether it has like a little swoop to it. Right? So the big question here is what exactly is the risk? Right? Um, when we have a really high exposure, we can measure the risk. We can tell you precisely what the risk estimate is for that individual or for that population. At the low doses, below 0.1 sievert, which includes us as occupational workers and our patients, the risk is not directly measurable. And so it's extrapolated from what happens at these higher doses. They move the line down they move the line down from those higher doses and say this must be what the risk is ab about, right? Um, nevertheless, the problem with doing this is that the risk related to your radiation exposure will definitely be ex uh, overshadowed by your risks from everything else that you do in your life that could potentially lead to cancer. Um, and the risk for cancer creation is never zero. So that's what makes the confusion here. What I'm saying is, if we chart this linear non-threshold dose out, all we've got data for is this stuff up here. We don't have any data below the 0 0.1 sievert line, right? So how did we get to this model? Well, we extrapolated it. We drew a nice, neat line and we just moved it down until it got to the bottom of the curve, or the bottom of the graph, I should say. Here's another point of debate related to this, whether the risk is absolute or relative. Right now, the science is leaning towards it being a relative risk. What does that mean? Absolute risks mean that the amount of cancer incidence is some absolute number. So that regardless, as the dose, in, as the age increases, we will see, here's all of the people where cancer naturally occurred, right? And then there's an equal number of people that we just add to it for the, ra for the radiation exposed population, right? If we say a radiation exposure will cause 25 more incidences of cancer, then we just add 25, to every age. That's an absolute risk. Versus if we say it's a relative risk, we are saying that the cancer incidence will increase relative to the increases in the general population. So here we see even more people who have cancer because the radiation, the population that received radiation exposure will increase exponentially. It will be some amount more and it will be tied to the relative size of that population. 
here is one of the major things that we have looked at um, to come up with some of these numbers, right? Um, and this is possibly one of the most difficult things for folks to understand. Um, and I, I don't mean just students, but I mean scientists and everyone. We're all kind of scratching our heads over this, okay? So we have a population that's exposed to high amounts of radiation after the use of atomic weapons, right? Within about five years um, after that radiation exposure, we start to see the incidence of leukemia creep up in that population. And then it reaches a, th it reaches a point where it's greater than that of the normal, what we'd expect the normal leukemia incidence to be, and it tails off. It slowly tails off. As that absolute risk, right, as that risk of leukemia starts to tail off, then we start to see an increase in all other cancers. Well, why is that? Well, more time has elapsed. Now we're talking about 10 years out, and we have an older population. And so, again, there's going to be some natural cancer incidence that occurs in that older population. But we did see um, an increase in solid tumors that was relative to that population size. Okay? So what I'm saying is the data was apparently contradictory. The leukemia data seemed to indicate that there was an absolute risk related to leukemia and radiation exposure. The, the solid tumor seemed to indicate a relative risk, right? So the scientists had to kind of create models for both. Um, it, it, it's possible that for as we get more data, we will know more about what causes. Are there certain cancers that have an absolute risk and certain other cancers that present a relative risk? That's possible, right? Is it possible that all cancers present a relative risk? Yeah, I think that's possible too. But we still need more data. There was an early... Um, cancer researcher that said something like along the lines of in God we trust all others must have data um, so we need that data in order to really know what it is that we're saying um, so the epidemiological data about Hiroshima and these survivors indicate that there is a chance of contracting leukemia as a result of the radiation exposure that's directly proportional to the magnitude of the radiation exposure and so this radiation-induced leukemia is assumed to follow a linear non-threshold dose response compared to leukemia in a population that has not been exposed to ionizing radiation. So this was perhaps the first time in the literature that the scientists said, look, all this absolute versus relative, we can't spend too much time worrying about that. What we're trying to do is create policies for safety and for regulation. So here is the... Here is the curve that you're going to work off of, this linear non-threshold curve. All right, well, let's talk about cataractogenesis, okay? There's a high probability with a single dose or repeated doses of radiation that we could create cataracts in the eye. The eyes are among the most radiosensitive organs of the body, any good radiation therapist should be able to tell you that. And also any CT technologist, too, because we do scan in the area of the eye quite a bit. So the result would be complete or partial loss of vision. This, the results from this initially came from experiments on laboratory rodents, but we've also seen it among people who are occupationally exposed to, like, fluoroscopy. Okay, switching gears just a little bit, our textbook talks about a doubling dose concept, and this came out of those, both the Hiroshima-Nagasaki data as well as the experiments by Muller and the other scientists on fruit fly populations. So the doubling dose is that radiation dose that causes a spontaneous, the number of spontaneous mutations occurring in a, in a given population 
to increase by 2, right? And it's assumed to have a mean value of 1.56 sievert. Do I expect you to memorize this number? No, I don't. I'm not going to ask you for, to quote me this number on a test. Um, it is just helpful to know that right now, even though we have a lot of debate about what exactly is the best way to model this stuff, we have arrived at a number that lets us know what we need to stay well below, right? Um, and we do manage to stay well below this for occupational exposure as well as for our patient populations. Let's talk a little bit about nonspecific lifespan shortening. Um, we've looked at some of these numbers, I think, already. So here's the loss of life expectancy for being an unmarried male is roughly 10 years, right? Um, influenza or pneumonia exposure can limit your life by about half a year. Drinking alcohol for all of its benefits, health and otherwise, can reduce your lifespan by approximately 100 days, okay? Um, we go on down to the one rim additional, so that'd be one rim in addition to working, in addition to just living and breathing in the cosmic rays that, bat, that we get to bask in every day of our lives, um, could potentially shorten your life by about 12 days. So the window that we typically tell x-ray tech, potential x-ray techs, therapists, and nuclear medicine folks is that your work in this field potentially has shortened your life by about two weeks. Um, that's looking at huge populations. It is probably time to update these numbers because you can see this was done in 1979 and a lot has changed since 1979, particularly people's average collective effective doses. The nuclear radiation industry, which we talked about a little bit last week, um, could potentially reduce your lifespan by less than a day. Again, this was reported prior to Chernobyl. 